So we've been working on redox reactions. We now know how to balance them. We know how to calculate the voltage when we pair a redox or a reduction and an oxidation reaction together. And this is how we make our batteries. And so today, Friday lecture, we're gonna cover or connect what we've learned in class to the real world. So we're gonna talk about batteries today a lot. And the, the worst thing that can happen after you spend your money, time and effort in building something, it corrodes. And so we're gonna talk about corrosion. It's a big problem. I mean, we just sort of touch on it in your, in your science, but when you get into industry, corrosion is a huge problem. So we'll talk about corrosion today. So we've done the first two parts, balancing redox, galvanic cells, and uh, we're gonna get into corrosion in batteries. So how do we decide which reactions to pair? Well, expense is one thing. You don't wanna pick the uh, most expensive elements like gold and silver, but, um, but you also wanna look at their electrical potentials. And so what I've done here in this redox table, so this is a, a, a reduction table similar to what you have in the homework. It's sorted high to low. And so if I take this top number and subtract any number below it, I'll get positive cell potentials because this is the most, this is the largest or highest number. And if you subtract any of the lower numbers, you're gonna get a positive cell potential, which means it's gonna be a spontaneous cell. And so what I've done is I've taken these elements, you know, gold, silver, copper, iron, zinc, and aluminum, put them across here with their cell potentials. And then I've taken this number and subtracted all of these. So these are all of the differences I could get by pairing gold with these other elements. And then silver is 0.8, so I subtracted all of the ones lower than 0.8, and that's these differences. And so this sort of difference table can tell me where my voltages are if I were to pair these materials. So what metals could we use to make a one and a half volt battery from this table? Well, we've got this right here, it's very close to one and a half volts. So I could pair silver and zinc Zinc is cheap, silver's not that cheap, so it may not be good economically, but it would be good in terms of trying to replace my alkaline batteries that I have. All my devices are geared towards one and a half volt batteries, and so this would be a nice replacement. And so this is the reaction. How would we couple these together? Well, we would have the silver reaction going forward. It would be reduced, and then we would reverse the zinc reaction. So the zinc would go from zinc solid to zinc two plus. So that's how we would couple those together. Uh, we would double the silver reaction because it only needs one electron and so we gotta get the electrons to match. And so then that's why there's two silvers in there. And so that would give us a 1.56 volt difference when everything is at one, um, one molar solution. So the two aqueous solutions, if they were one molar, then it would be 1.56 uh, volts. And so this is how we come up with that. Again, it's the, the, the cathode reaction where the reduction, that's the silver reduction. And then we're subtracting the zinc reduction, which means we swap the sign. And so it's uh, 0.8 minus uh, a negative 0.76 or 1.56 volts. Okay, so let's say we make this into a battery. Uh, but if I look at my devices, a lot of times they have four double A's put in there. And so that's a six volt thing. So how do we get six volts out of this? We have to put the four batteries in series. So if you'll notice in your battery packs, a lot of times it, it'll be um, four batteries and they'll be put in there like this. The little button will be on the top. Okay. And then it'll be down here where the little button's on the bottom. Right. And then this one will be in there like this, where the button's on the top. And then the, the last one will be down here. Do you know what they're doing right there? They're connecting tops to bottoms. So they're putting them in series, like what I've shown down below. And so that's why they go up and down, up and down. They're making, they're stacking them on top of each other. And whenever you stack them, the potentials are additive. So it's 1.5 times four, which gets us six volts. So you can look in those battery packs and see them stack like that. And that's called in series, so they're in a serial order. So let's take a side trip into physics. This is Ohm's law, okay? V equals IR. And, and uh, this was that equation that that student told me when we were doing temperature conversions. They said, what goes in the box or what goes in the circle? And I, I didn't know what she was talking about because she was uh, 
you know, temperatures. And they were they were doing this thing of uh, of the circle with V equals I. Let's see, I get this wrong every time. How do I even do it? The V's on top. The V's on top. Yeah. yeah. See. Yeah. See, I can't even do it because I don't even do this stupid thing. Yeah. Okay. V, I, and R. Is that right? V equals I R. Right. And then I is V over R, and R is V over I. Mm -hmm. All right. And this is not algebra. <laughs> and if I ever see you do that, I'm going to break your fingers. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, just learn your algebra, right? So you want to solve for I, you divide both sides by R. This is algebra. Okay, the R is cancel. I equals V over R. It's not any more difficult. <laughs> okay, so if your teachers taught you that, that's garbage because it won't work with an intercept. Let's say this had some intercept, uh, you know, C over here. Then it's broke. The ladybug doesn't work. Okay, so, you know, learn your algebra. Anyway, rant is over. Uh, so V is voltage, and that's the strength of the force pushing those electrons. And I is current. That's how many electrons are going past a particular point in, in a, per second. And so you can pick a point in the circuit and count how many electrons are going by. And one amp is one coulomb per second. And an electron, one electron uh, charge is equal to 1.6. Yeah, I think so. Times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So an amp, that's a lot of electrons. That's, you know, that's about, you know, half of that, right? So one times 10 to the 19 or 10 to the 19 electrons going every second. That's one amp. And then resistance is just the resistance to flow of those electrons. And so that balance of flow and resistance is equal to the voltage. Or if you push harder with the given resistance, you get... Like you push twice as hard, you get twice as many, uh, twice as much current, twice as many amps with the same resistance. Okay. Now, what is the resistance? Well, if you've got a metal wire, um, that metal wants to hold on to its electrons. And so forcing those electrons to flow through that wire, they repel each other. And so they kind of charge up. That's a capacitive effect. And then just the flow past all of those positive nuclei, there's, there's some resistance to flow. And so every little... Um, metal has slightly different resistivity, and so that's um, that's where the resistance comes from. And then power, I just want to put that in there too, because that would be then watts or joules per second, and that's voltage times current. So if you want to know uh, how much power you could get, say, out of a wall plug, it's a 15 amp wall plug, so that's the max current, and then it's 110 volts, so, you know, it's roughly 1,500 um, watts, so 1,500 joules per second. Okay, so here's this idea of voltage being the height of a waterfall. So this is the mental uh, analogy I like to give students. And and so um, that's, that's the force that that water feels by gravity. So if you wanted to increase the height of the waterfall, you're increasing the voltage, but you're not changing the, the flow. Um, the, the width of the waterfall is the flow. Okay, and so that that way you could think about, you know, when we double the reactions, when we're balancing, we're not doubling the voltage, but we are able to double the current. And so if we double it, that's, you know, again, you double the redox reaction. We're not doubling the potential. We're just doubling the width or the, the width of the fall. We're doubling the um, amount of current that it can produce. And parallel batteries double the current, not the voltage. And so if you have two batteries, you have essentially two waterfalls, but the same height. Um, if you put those batteries in series, then it's like stacking two waterfalls. <laughs> okay, so you have twice the height, so twice the voltage. Um, and so that's, uh, that's what you get when you put them in series, you, you do double the voltage. So let's talk about alkaline batteries. Again, I don't have any endorsements by Duracell. I just put them in there because it was easy to grab that picture, and y'all would know that's a battery. Okay. And uh, But let's talk about alkaline batteries. Now, we have... It's a confusing name because we have alkali metals and we have alkaline earth metals. 
and this is an alkaline battery, but another use of the word alkaline means basic, okay? So in this use of alkaline, they really just mean pH, what do I say? What is basic pH? Good, greater than seven, greater than seven, okay? So the solutions in these batteries are basic. That's why they say they're corrosive. Don't get them on your skin. If you have a battery that's corroded and you pull it out and you get that salt on your skin, it's probably potassium hydroxide or some kind of hydroxide, and it, it will eventually burn your skin, but you can wash it off. So you get it on your hands, just wash it off and do not rub your eye. I mean, obvious chemical hygiene, right? Don't get it in your eye and wash your hands. It's not gonna like, it's not toxic enough to kill you on contact. You know, there are some things that are that bad, but not in commercial batteries that we sell to kids. Okay, so here's the reactions, the half reactions. So we have this um, at the uh, <clears throat> on the anode side we have zinc and hydroxide, which is probably potassium hydroxide, and it goes to uh, zinc oxide and uh, and water and two electrons. Okay, so that's the anode, that's the oxidation reaction. Oxidation is loss of electrons and there are the electrons on the right. And this is the potential for that reaction, 1.28 volts. Okay, and then here's the manganese oxide reacting with water and two electrons and giving, I don't know, di dimanganate, I guess. Uh, you've got two manganese, ox uh, manganese atoms and three oxygens. And what it did was that that water, so if you have if you have two of these, you've got two manganese and you got four oxygens. And the water steals one of those oxygens to make two hydroxides. And so then what's left here is both of the manganese atoms and three oxygens, because the water took one of the four. Okay. And it needed a couple of electrons to do that so that it could make these negative hydroxides. And that one has a uh, positive potential as well. Okay. And so then uh, we combine these. It's really a kind of an interesting reaction. The electrons work out. So we have two electrons on products and reactants, so they're gone. Look at the water. The water also cancels. So we have a water on the right-hand side. We have a water on the left-hand side. And so we don't even see the water participating in this reaction. We have, two zinc, we have zinc plus two of these manganese dioxides making zinc oxide and this other manganese oxide. And it looks difficult, right? There's solids everywhere. So how does this reaction happen? So the water is mystery. It's like hidden in the net reaction, but it's in the individual half reactions. Okay. And the cell potential is 1.43 volts. And you say, but wait, I thought this was a one and a half volt battery. And it is if you don't have any products. So if you start with really low products, Q is high, and then it starts to um, move forward and these are the voltages down here. So 100% capacity for this battery, they can get it up to 1.59 volts. Um, and then under load, it's about 1.5, 1.49 volts. So under a small load, which is the way you wanna measure the push power of a battery, you wanna put it um, on, on a load. So it, the circuit needs to be connected and it needs to be pushing a small amount of electrons so that you can see what the real potential is. You know, if you just take a voltmeter and stick it on the on the end of a battery, positive and negative terminals, uh, it will give you the zero current voltage. So it'll be, um, it, it will seem higher than it is. If you look down here, the capacity, when it gets down to zero percent, when there's zero load, your voltmeter will still say it has 1.1 volts, which sounds like enough to do stuff. But as soon as you let the current flow a little bit, it doesn't push very hard. It's 0.6 volts under load. And so that's the real voltage of a battery is how much it can push under load. Okay. It's, it's kind of like, I can wave my arms really fast, but you get puts five pound weights in my arm. Then you really see my strength. And so it's the same kind of with a battery. You know, if you just put it on a voltmeter, um, there's not much current flowing. And so it's like waving its arms without any weight. And it can show you, it sort of lies to you and says, I've got a lot more voltage than I do. So, so battery testers are more complicated than, than you imagine. They, you know, you, 
It's best to have one that tests under load. Okay, let's look at what's going on though in this battery. We have the, the zinc anode and oxidation takes place at the anode. So this is a bunch of that zinc solid and it's very porous, it's a spongy so that the hydroxide and water can be in there. So we also have water uh, or it's gonna produce water. It's gonna turn that hydroxide into water, okay? So, and then out here on the outside, we have the manganese dioxide plus water and it's gonna produce the, the hydroxide. So this side is producing hydroxide and that hydroxide has to make it over here to the zinc. So the hydroxide has to go through this ion conducting separator. And that's the key to all of these batteries. It's easy to get the electrons to throw, flow through our circuit. It's really hard to get the ions to go from one side to the other. And that's, that's always the current limiting step. I'll say current limiting technology. If you solve that problem, uh, you will be hired by Elon Musk in a, in a snap. <laughs> because that's the thing. Pushing electrons is not a problem. Pushing ions, that's the thing that limits how fast and how many electrons you can push. And if you want to really accelerate, if you want a lot of torque and a lot of power, you need to move ions as fast as possible. And that's what's limiting our batteries is the is that and then also the recharge so being able to push them backwards the recharge those batteries that's that's a necessary thing too let's talk about automobile batteries so here's the lead uh lead acid battery so yeah the lead is reacting with sulfuric acid and making lead sulfate two hydrogen ions and two electrons so it lost electrons okay so that's the oxidation reaction here's the reduction reaction this is lead oxide reacting with those acid protons and sulfuric acid, the, the oxygen on, on that lead oxide gets stolen by the protons and by the acid protons on the sulfuric acid and produces lead sulfate. And so this is also kind of a really cool reaction when you cancel everything that's alike on both sides. You have lead and lead oxide reacting directly with sulfuric acid and making lead sulfate plus water. So we want the most pure battery acid we can get. We want as pure sulfuric acid in that battery container as we can get. Uh, so there are no side reactions and, and the lead solid and the lead oxide will react. So we have spongy lead and spongy lead oxide in lead grid electrodes. So this looks like a waffle over here, but the little holes in the waffle go all the way through. And they, they stick the lead oxide in those little waffle holes and they stick the spongy lead in the other waffle holes, and then they connect the, the different electrodes to each other, fill it with sulfuric acid, and you've got a lead acid battery. And this is a pretty good battery. It'll give you, you know, hundreds of amps when you first connect it. And so if you look at the top of the battery, it'll be 400, 360, depends on the size of the battery, cranking amps. And so that's that initial push. It can put a lot of electrons out. So this, is, this was our first sort of battery for transportation. Um, when we went to electric golf carts and small vehicles, you could use lead acid batteries. The downside is they're lead, they're super heavy. And so that's the problem that, that these guys, uh, that has really made them uh, lag in terms of their use. Uh, the sulfuric acid is, uh, as it's consumed, the density changes. It goes from sulfuric acid, which is really dense, to just water, which is not very dense. And a fresh battery acid is a density of about 1.28 grams per mil, whereas water is one gram per mil. Even as a kid, I thought it was pretty cool. They had a little sight glass in the side of the battery. So there was a little tube that went down in the battery. And in that tube was a little fluorescent ball, like a little yellow ball. and Whenever the battery was fresh, it had sulfuric acid in it, and that, that ball was slightly less dense than 1.28.
Okay, so it's like maybe 1.1 gram per mil, the little plastic ball. And so when the battery was good, it floated and you could look in the top and see the ball and it looked like a little light because it was fluorescent, okay? But then when the battery was dead, this density went to one and the ball was more dense than water and it sank. And so it looked like the light went out. And so this is a way to kind of put an indicator on the battery without using electricity. Because you wouldn't want the indicator to drain your battery. It's like, well, it was good the last time I looked, but the indicator light drained all the juice, and that would be stupid. Yeah. So they used this real clever thing that was based on the density of the sulfuric acid. And uh, anyway, I always thought that was neat as a kid. Um, I didn't know what was going on as a kid, but later on, um, you know, I was like, oh, that's how that worked. Okay. And a recharging a battery can cause hydrogen to build up. We typically put a, a battery charger on here and it can electrolyze the water and make hydrogen and oxygen. And it, it's a pretty bad smell. You'll know when you smell the hydrogen, it stings your nose. And so you need to ventilate the area because if that hydrogen builds up with the oxygen and uh, say you turn on a fan or flip on the switch, that spark could cause an explosion. And so it could blow the battery up or it could blow up your garage or wherever this thing is. Um, so definitely ventilate whenever you're charging a battery. Uh, this is old technology. It's been invented in 1859. Uh, these batteries can go through 1500 recharge cycles, which is pretty good. Um, I think some of the lithium ion batteries beat that. Okay. I mentioned electrolysis. So uh, electrolysis or electrolytic cells, they use a power source to force the galvanic cell to run backwards. So if this battery or cell will produce 1.5 volts and I swap the poles and plug it into the wall at 1.6 volts, it'll go backwards. And that's how you recharge the batteries. So you run them, you run those reaction backwards, you make the products back into reactants, and then you've charged the battery up. And, and it's, a, it's a real chemical problem more than an electrical problem as to whether a battery can be recharged or not. It has to be able to form the structures of the reactants that can, when you take the charge off, go back to being a battery. Sometimes that doesn't work. And so for your alkaline cells, <clears throat> I don't exactly know why, but <clears throat> it just won't, it won't recharge. So the structures of the manganese oxide probably are the, are the thing that kill it. Um, so this <clears throat> hydrogen and oxygen making water is so spontaneous that we have essentially no hydrogen in our atmosphere, no hydrogen running around in our oceans or in the ground. <clears throat> because there's so much oxygen in the soil, in the water, in the atmosphere, uh, this has scrubbed hydrogen from our, from our atmosphere and, and our environment. <clears throat> So when you hear politicians typically talk about uh, the hydrogen economy, hold your wallet, okay? Because that's there is no hydrogen economy. There is no hydrogen. You know, hydrogen can use, be used to store energy, but it's not a primary source. To get hydrogen, we need to electrolyze water or pull it off of some other compound. And so that requires electricity or some sort of energy input. So we could put energy in and get hydrogen, but where do we get the energy we just used, right? So we have to generate energy to make hydrogen. That's okay if we want to store it in hydrogen. So you could you could use electricity to make hydrogen, and then you have hydrogen, and it it's portable. You move it around, right? And then you run this reaction backwards or back forwards and make water and to get your energy back out. So you could store energy in hydrogen, but you're not, it's not a primary fuel. You cannot find it in the environment and then just use it as is. You know, it's really difficult to compete against something like natural gas. We poke a hole in the ground and it comes out. There's no conspiracy there. It's just super easy to get. Okay. Other examples of electrolysis <clears throat> are silver plated jewelry, chrome plated bumpers. You know, we, we use electricity to run these reactions and going from ions to the metal. So we can put, say, an iron bumper in a chromium aqueous solution and then run that reaction with electricity so the chrome becomes a metal on top of the iron. Um, here's an example. So 
We measure the current in amps, which is coulombs per second. We have this conversion factor using Faraday's constant of the number of electrons and, and coulombs. You know, so one mole of electrons is 96,000 coulombs. And then we use the half reactions to define this electron to metal conversion. So here's a good example of an example problem. So what mass of silver was plated on a piece of jewelry if it was supplied with 10 amps for 30 minutes in a silver nitrate solution, okay? And you have everything you need to know to do that problem with all of your constants. And I have that Faraday's constant on the periodic table that I pass out. So this is how you do that problem. You have the half reaction. So you know one mole of electrons will give you one mole of silver. And so this is the, the long conversion. So we, <clears throat> we have 30 minutes and our, and our current is 10 amps. That's a coulomb per second. So we wanna get out of minutes and into seconds. So minutes, we got 60 seconds per minute. Then we use this, this current right here, 10 coulombs per second so that we can get to moles of electrons. One mole of electrons is Faraday's constant. So that's Faraday's constant F. So our seconds have canceled, our coulombs have canceled, and now I have moles of electrons. Now this is where I have to have the, the balanced half reaction. If it was chromium and it was Cr3+, plus, there'd be three moles of electrons for one mole of chromium. Now in silver, it's just a one-to-one. -one. So my moles of electrons are gone, and I've got moles of silver, but this is asking for mass. And so then I've got to go to the periodic table and find my silver and it's 107.9 grams. So the moles of silver are gone. So it's really straightforward. It just, the problem looks scary because you haven't seen those problems before. Okay, key points. You got to know what an amp is. Got to know it because it's a coulomb per second. If you don't know that, then you, you can't do the problem. You got to know Faraday's constant. You got to know that that's the cool, coulomb, how many coulombs there are in a mole of electrons. If you don't have those two pieces of information, then you just can't do the problem. Okay, okay so there are other electrochemical applications, uh, and you use these things in the lab. You've used pH pens, perhaps, in your lab, the pH probes. And so that's just a use of an ion selective electrode. It's got Nernst equation built in and it will take pH and you can use that. Uh, it measures the concentration in solution using electrochemistry and then converts it over to pH. But that's not the only electrochemical probe that they have. You've got probes that measure ammonia. So instead of a pH probe, it's an ammonia probe. Oh, you know, why, why might, might she need that? Well, for water quality. You know, the amount of water or ammonia in wastewater or whatever, or nutrients. Like if you run a nursery and you're, you're fertilizing, you want to know how much runoff is coming out. You could measure the total nitrogen of the water that comes out and, and see how much fertilizer you're, you're losing. Uh, chloride as well, fluoride probes. So we have, you know, electrochemical probes for all kinds of species. <clears throat> And this is just a simple way to measure concentrations. You make a sort of a calibration curve with different known concentrations to calibrate the probe, make sure it's working well, and then you can sit there and test all day long and, and write down your numbers. Let's talk about fuel cells. So these are interesting. This is a sort of a perpetual battery. You think about the alkaline battery, you buy it, all the reactants are packaged in the battery. What if I could add more reactants as it goes? Well, that's a flow battery. That's what a fuel cell is. So it's just like a battery, but you can constantly add the reactants and then get rid of the waste. And so down here, if you add hydrogen here and you add oxygen here, then they react in this, in this setup. There's a catalyst, there's a membrane, there's electrodes, and the and the product, the waste product is water. So it's just combining hydrogen and oxygen and making water. And it's making the electrons go through our circuit. So that's really fantastic. So this was done in the 60s. This was on the Apollo ship. And so whenever there was Apollo 13 was the one that messed up, the movie was made out of with Tom Hanks. You know, what they did was they said, we're gonna stir the oxygen tanks. And it was a cleaning issue. 
there was some residue in one of the valves in the oxygen tank and it exploded and blew the side of the spaceship off, you know, halfway to the moon. Yeah, so I encourage you to watch that. But whenever you hear them say, we got to stir the oxygen tanks and they flip a switch and they hear boom and they feel this thing and they flip it off and they see that they're venting gas and they're spinning around and all of that. That was uh, because they were, they had hydrogen and oxygen on board <clears throat> to run their fuel cells. And that's why from that point on, they had to conserve power because they had lost some of their um, their uh, fuel that was gonna run their electricity. So it's pretty challenging in engineering. And this, again, the, the, the cation exchange or proton exchange membrane, that's the current limiting step. So if you find a better way to, to conduct protons through a barrier, then, you know, you, you're gonna, you're gonna do fine. <laughs> you will be able to name your price. Okay. So this is the, the fuel cell. Do we have hydrogen fuel cells? And we have them in the space program in the 60s. Do we still have them? Yes. This was sort of a, a, a big um, a big deal up in Ohio. They had a hydrogen fuel cell powered bus and to kind of show the environmental uh, impact or lack of environmental impact, they had the public officials drink from the tailpipe because the, the exhaust gas is water. There's no carbon monoxide, no acid rain or anything coming out of the back of that. And so it was kind of a nice little um, uh, publicity stunt. Um, still, they've got to use something, probably electricity to make that hydrogen. You know, so that, again, if we had hydrogen in the ground and we could poke a hole in and pull it out, then this would be golden. But we'll see in a second, the efficiencies of these things uh, are not the best. So here's the energy conversion efficiencies. Yeah. So whenever they talk about, say, um, the efficiency of, say, an electric generator, 98%. And that's great. Okay. But that's a narrow view of things. Okay. We need to take into account where did the uh, power come that you deliver to that electric generator? Was it a gas power generator? If it was a gas power generator, we started with gasoline fuel and 25% of that got turned into mechanical energy, a spinning the generator. And then the, mag the magneto on the generator generated the electricity. So it's 25% times 98%. So probably about 23% efficient going from chemical fuel to electricity. Our power plants, okay, they make steam. So they burn coal, natural gas, some use oil, and that's 88%, we'll give them the better number, 88% efficient in making hot steam. And then that steam spins a turbine. The turbine is 46%. And this is like the best, you know. So they're trying to get every bit of energy out of that steam as it spins that turbine. And then the turbine turns the electric generator. So this is coal to steam to turbine to electricity these are the efficiencies you have to multiply them by each other so it's 0.88 times 0.46 times 0.91 all of those are less than one and so it gets smaller every step that you go and so we're talking about 40 percent efficient if you look at the energy information agency or administration uh, the electrical grid and delivering it to your home you lose another nine percent so from our power plant to your house is 31% of the joules you started with. So if you started with 100 joules of chemical energy, you got 31 at your house using electricity. Okay. But that's what we've got. And that's the best we can do at this point. So the thing that I'm on a crusade to do is right here with thermal, right? With thermal that's heat. So you can make hot water, hot air, hot food, dry clothes with heat that comes straight from chemical fuel at 88% efficient. And so that's why if you're going to generate heat, I'm trying to convince you try to work where you don't have to use electricity to do that because you're using 88 percent of the joules you started with not 40 or 31 percent of the joules you started with 
It doesn't make sense not to use something like methane to heat your water or to heat your food, natural gas, okay? And and the thing that drives me crazy is when politicians say, well, we're, we're going to get rid of all of this. And so in New York, they passed a ban on, on plumbing any new buildings and any new construction with natural gas lines. Like they're ensuring that we use more fossil fuels. And so it's just crazy. As a scientist, I look at that and I'm like, okay, yeah, right. You want to eventually get rid of fossil fuels. But right now, using fossil fuels like methane to heat your food, your water, your air is saving a ton of fossil fuels. Until you get the electrical grid switched over to something that's not fossil, you're burning so much more fossil fuel. If we can go to nuclear or something, which we'll cover next time, then you can save all of it. But at this point, if you're still going to generate electricity with fossil fuels, then you're absolutely dumb to use electricity to heat. Now, that's not always in your control. Here in Westridge, we don't have natural gas lines and we don't have propane. So we're kind of at the mercy of our neighborhood. But just you guys are going to be scientists. Y'all are going to be the ones that solve these problems in the future. And so I just want you to think about these efficiency charts. If we take the electricity and make hydrogen and then make the electricity again, okay, we have 72% for the electrolysis and 40% making the, the electricity and we're down to 11%. So that's a nightmare. So that city bus, if they use the fossil fuels to make the electricity, to make the hydrogen, to reuse in that city bus, they're only getting 11% of the joules that they had in the methane to begin with. <laughs> so it's a great stunt, you know, and the mayor can drink out of the tailpipe, but good grief, what a waste. Um, solar cells, okay, solar cells are 15, they're getting up to 20% efficient, that's pretty good. They're not quite at 40% yet, but the beauty for solar is we're not paying for the sun. We are paying for the solar cells, but that energy that's hitting us dwarfs every other source of energy that we have. So it really does have the largest potential for growth, but it's a it's a it's um, got a huge footprint in mining the materials. So it's not great in that respect. It's got a huge footprint too, in terms of generating megawatts, you need a huge area. And, and then technologically they're fragile, they break. Okay. Now some of the flow, flow batteries can charge and recharge. So 70 to 90%, once you get electricity, say from a solar installation, you can store that in a fuel cell, and then you can use that fuel cell to regenerate electricity. So it's not chemical fuel like a fossil fuel. It might be some zinc or manganese or something like that, like a, maybe a lithium ion battery. Um, and so you can charge and recharge some of those fuel cells and get quite high efficiencies. So. Uh, incandescent lighting. So let's just look at lighting real quick. So the, you know, light bulbs with a filament in there is about 4% efficient in terms of generating light. So they generate way more heat than light. And that's why some places have banned them. Um, I'm not a fan of bands, but I am a fan of saying, hey, you'll save money if you go to fluorescence or LEDs. So we get, you know, five times more light out of an LED than we get out of an incandescent bulb for the same amount of electricity that you paid for. So, so they're great. They're also more expensive. Let's talk about corrosion, the enemy of, of all of our creations. So remember, if we're sorting high to low in the reduction potentials, clockwise reactions are spontaneous. And here's oxygen. I think I made it red on your notes. So this is oxygen in the atmosphere. And so it will attack all of these metals. And up the ones above oxygen, it will not attack those metals. Because again, that's not a spontaneous reaction. So gold, silver can just sit there and look at oxygen and say, sorry, I'm not going to react with you. It's, it's, it's not spontaneous. So that's why our jewelry metals, our noble metals, don't don't tarnish as as much. Silver will react a little bit, but but uh, but gold will just not react with oxygen. And so that's why we like it, because it stays shiny. You know, these metals below that oxygen reduction potential will spontaneously oxidize in moist air. So moisture is the key. This is what we call the corrosion square or corrosion squares. And if you remove any square, you can stop corrosion. And so up in the panhandle of Texas, it's really dry. I, I had a smoker and I read the instructions like I always do. And it said, after you smoke your meats and stuff, um, clean it out because the ash 
from the wood has a lot of uh, um, hydroxides in it, basically. And and then with the moisture in the air, it'll rust out that, that firebox. And I did it religiously for the first year or so, but after the first year, I just got tired of doing that. And so I just quit and it never rusted out. And I was like, wow, that's a heck of a smoker. That's really thick metal. No, it's just dry up there. I moved down here to Huntsville, brought that smoker in, set it up in my backyard, like eight months had holes in it. It just rusted right through. And so in the panhandle, I had removed the conductor. I had removed the water. So if you can keep salt and water off the surface and keep it dry, then you don't have corrosion. So that's one of the big uh, things that you can do. Um, you could remove oxygen, you could paint it, you could coat it and keep the oxygen away. Um, here's aluminum you know, oxide, very spontaneous. But it's interesting, aluminum oxide, this coating will stop further corrosion. It's called a passive layer. So you have the metal and then you have the oxide and then you have O2 on the outside. And so that oxide layer won't let oxide get to the fresh metal. So that's removing oxygen. Um, iron has a more porous oxide. And so iron lets the, lets the moisture through. And so that's why iron will rust like crazy. Um, here's how we stop it. So here's iron, here's a water droplet. Um, here's the oxide growing. Um, so one way to stop this is to put a sacrificial anode in there. So this zinc is an anode and it reacts with oxygen more. It's more spontaneous to react with oxygen than the iron. And so the zinc gets chewed up. You see this sacrifice right here. And so it will act as a sacrificial layer and protect the iron. And it, all it has to do is be exposed to the air and the moisture. You know, this iron could be a pipe in the ground. You know, and as long as that zinc touches that pipe and is exposed to the moist air, then the zinc will get chewed up over here and the iron that's down underground in contact with water and everything will be protected. So you can protect a whole pipe by just sticking some zinc or magnesium or aluminum on there. And so these sacrificial anodes, you can buy these and put them in your hot water heater. And so I have an RV, We, this is the little drain plug for the water heater, and it's got a, a zinc, basically a zinc plug that goes in there and sits in the water, and that protects the tank. So the tank could rust, because it's got heat, it's got salty water, it's got oxygen, but the the zinc will, will oxidize before the tank, and it protects the tank. Think about deep sea pipelines and oil rigs with legs that are down in the ocean. You've got salty, salty water. This is super conductive. Well, not that's a technical term. It's not super. It's very conductive. <laughs> okay. Uh, and these are deep sea anodes. So this piece right here, this huge thing, which is about the size of, uh, I don't know, um, it's huge. It's like eight feet long and, you know, maybe 12 inches, like a like a foot wide, 18 feet long. Um, and they stick that on in the ocean and that will just get chewed up and protect the strength of the legs of that oil rig. And then you see this around the house. If you have galvanized uh, buckets or metal, um, that zinc, it's, it's steel, um, but it's coated in zinc. And you can kind of see that mottled surface, that's a zinc coating. And that zinc will oxidize first before it rusts. And then you could also paint things. You could passivate them. That oxide layer on uh, aluminum is a passivating layer. And then you can also um, do some conversion coatings. Here's a zinc chromate coating on steel called alodyne coating. And you see that it makes kind of a yellow color to these tools and wrenches. And those have just been uh, coated so that they don't oxidize and don't rust. So we put millions and millions of dollars into corrosion prevention. And it's most important in, in uh, like pipes. So if you think about the, the fire loop system, water's just sitting in that fire loop and it's under quite a bit of pressure, 150 pounds per square inch. And if it rusts the hole, all of a sudden you've got a blast of water, you know, it's gonna ruin your building. And 
And so, you know, corrosion prevention is, is big money and it's important. So next time we're going to start talking about nuclear power, nuclear energy, nuclear reactions. So I'll see you then. My brother is a big...